This week, the US launched a fresh attack on Chinese telecommunication companies. A congressional committee issued a warning to companies in the US, saying Huawei and ZTE may be a front for Chinese spying, and they shouldn't be trusted. But here in New Zealand, Huawei is expanding. The company's hiring more staff as part of its contract to help build our ultra-fast broadband network. The government is following the advice of our intelligence agency, the GCSB, which has allayed any security fears about Huawei. But an intelligence analyst, Paul Buchanan, says we should be worried. He'll join us live in just a moment. But first, this report by Natasha Smith. <laughs> Winning the presidency of the United States relies on the perfect combination of personality and policy. And this time round, that includes tough talk on China. We've brought more trade cases against China in one term than the previous administration did in two. And I know the Chinese are planning on getting to the moon. They're actually working very hard to get a rocket to the moon. They'll get there, I'm sure. Congratulations. And when they do, they'll find an American flag there that's been there for 43 years. Off the podium, the political attacks go even further. Huawei Technologies, up to its eyeballs with the Chinese military. It didn't stop Bain Capital from trying to partner Huawei with a U.S. defense contractor. And Mitt Romney had a piece of the deal. It'd be naive to expect American election advertising to be subtle. Ads like these are playing in the crucial swing seat of Ohio, where manufacturing is threatened by cheap Chinese goods. Under Obama, we've lost over half a million manufacturing jobs. And for the first time, China is beating us. Seven times Obama could have stopped China's cheating. Seven times, he refused. It's China's alleged cheating that has put its biggest telecommunication company in the spotlight. It's China's alleged cheating that's put its biggest telecommunication company in the spotlight. It claims to have evidence from employees that the company can't be trusted. These allegations describe a company that has not followed United States legal obligations or international standards of business behaviour. If I were an American company today, and I'll tell you this as the chairman of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and you were looking at Huawei, I would find another vendor. If you care about your intellectual property, if you care about your consumer's privacy, and you care about the national security of the United States of America. This follows Australia blocking Huawei from having any part in building its national broadband network. But there are other governments like the UK and New Zealand that say Huawei is OK. Our securities agencies have been uh, very, um, you know, worked, worked through the exercise before and after the, um, uh, the contract was, was let. In May this year, we visited Huawei headquarters in Shenzhen, southern China. Its massive campus is home to 40,000 employees. Most work in research and development. It's also 100% owned by its own Chinese employees. But it does admit to receiving trade finance from the state. We asked its corporate affairs manager about the security concerns. $32 billion in business last year. You don't get to this point unless companies trust your people, your products and your brand. So we, we feel very, very confident in our track record. Much of the criticism about Huawei is levelled at corruption within the Chinese government and the company's founder, who was a member of the Communist Army. He was an engineer with no military rank. So in the early 1980s, when the, the PLA um, scaled back operations for its engineering uh, department and core, uh, he was laid off and he's had no connection with the PLA since. But the US has its doubts. And after the release of this week's congressional report, Huawei made this statement. The report released by the committee today employs many rumours and speculations to prove non-existent accusations. We have to suspect that the only purpose of such a report is to impede competition and to obstruct Chinese ICT companies from entering the US market. Last year, President Obama hosted China's President Hu Jintao and talked of closer relations. But this week's criticism provoked an angry reaction from the Chinese Foreign Ministry. We hope that the US Congress will respect facts, discard prejudice and make more contributions to China-US economic cooperation and trade instead of the contrary. 
But whether political posturing or commercial interests are at play between China and the US, New Zealanders are again asking questions about whether the government knows what it's doing. The field's going very well. <laughs> Huawei is already installing its broadband equipment underground for our new ultra-fast broadband network. So is our government blind to the concerns about the Chinese company, or have our intelligence agencies got it right? Natasha Smith there. Paul Buchanan is a former policy analyst and intelligence consultant to the US government's security agencies. He's now the director of 36th Parallel Assessments. He joins us now. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. So the government seems to think that we have nothing to fear, really. Are we right to accept the government's judgment on this? Well, I think we have to because the contract's already been let. I guess what we should understand when it comes particularly to cyber espionage is the bigger the market, the more cable has to be laid. The more the cable is laid, the easier it is to put what are known as backdoor bugs into the cable. On the other hand, the massive amounts of data make it hard for those putting in the bugs to target specific entities, again, just the, the massive amount of data. In a smaller market such as New Zealand, it is much easier for the security services to locate bugs. But on the other hand, for those who may wish to put in the bugs, it's easier for them to target individuals. Because let's be frank, the decision-making community in New Zealand, both political and corporate, is a relatively small number of people. And so it is very possible that a foreign entity may try to use the uh, broadband infrastructure for espionage purposes, but I guess the good news is the GCSB would have an easier time of locating those bugs, and if Mr. Joyce is correct, and then they've already ensured one way or another that uh, those bugs won't be there in the first place. Do you think Huawei is tied in with the Chinese government? Uh, yes, I, I believe so. I think that the Chinese government is a silent partner in Huawei, uh, despite the protestations that it's a private company. And the reason I say that is because the Chinese have 12 strategic industries that the state is very, very much involved with and very concerned with. One of them is telecommunications. It's part of Chinese power expansion. And uh, given the fact that the Chinese regime does not have an independent judiciary, does not have an independent legislature, that means that in the areas where it has a strategic interest, the Chinese Communist Party uh, makes the calls as to how to apply those interests or how to promote those interests. Uh, in the global arena. So it doesn't necessarily mean that Huawei is evil because, let's face it, there are a lot of state capitalist systems in which the regime is involved yeah. with strategic sectors. But uh, particularly the Americans, but not only the Americans, seem to think there are three problems with Huawei. It's that relationship with the regime. Mm -hmm. They play loose with market rules. There have been accusations, as we saw in the report, of bribery and corruption. Uh, intellectual property theft, violations of copyright. So they're not good corporate actors in the minds of at least some American lawmakers. And then, of course, there are national security issues. Sure. Our government, though, says it, it's, it's got systems in place that will make them play by the rules. So in theory, that corruption and what have you wouldn't be an issue for New Zealand. That's their argument. Well, maybe it's because it's a small market, but let's, let's be very clear on this. Our, our major intelligence partners particularly the Australians and the United States, and from what I understand, the Canadians are about to ban Huawei from getting they're involved. They're considering it, yes. They, yeah. We're running against the, the flow, if you will. We, it's we're okay, though. New Zealand sometimes does that. Uh, we're not as independent as we claim to be. Okay. Let's uh, suggest for a moment that Huawei is doing this, and there is uh, some illegal capturing of data from New Zealand. What data are they interested in? What would they want from us? Well, again, just, just let's remember that the overlap between government computers, private computers, and a very small market like New Zealand is more extensive than in a much bigger market. They would be interested, obviously, in corporate espionage. Again, assuming that they, they play loose. Uh, you know, they would like to know uh, investment strategies of New Zealand firms in China. I mean, if you can get a heads up on what a potential trade partner is thinking prior to entering into a negotiation, that gives you some leverage. So they would do that. And then let us remember, even though it would not be a direct uh, approach to the Echelon Five Eyes network, it is very possible, given the limited number of people involved in intelligence decision making and the like, that they could be targeted in their personal lives so as to find a back door 
into the intelligence network. Let's face it, if you can get into someone's personal computer and you can get their email lists and what have you, I would just say that operational security in New Zealand, um, particularly amongst the political class, has been less than optimal. We see leaks, we see all sorts of things going on. And if you're specifically targeting someone that you know has a important decision-making role, be it in intelligence, be it in defense, uh, New Zealand is a place where you could very probably start to uh, mine the data from that person. Okay, so you've been involved you know, with the Pentagon and, and various American agencies. We've got a pretty good relationship with China. We've got a warming relationship with America. How would America view it, do you think, if we carry on, which it looks like we're going to, with Huawei as a, as a key player in New Zealand? What would that make, perhaps, the Pentagon do, do you think? I don't, I don't think they're going to be very happy. And I don't think it won't be so much the Pentagon because they receive intelligence from the National Security Agency. The National Security Agency are the people who are charged with countering cyber espionage. And let's just look at it this way. Um, the reason I say that New Zealand is not as independent as we may, may wish to think is that we have become, with the Wellington and Washington agreements, first-tier military and intelligence partners of the United States. That is bound to attract the interests of U.S. adversaries. Might be China, might be Russia, but now that will attract their interest because we are part of that five eyes. I mean, we are a very unique small country in that on intelligence matters of a signalless intelligence and technical intelligence sort, we play with the big boys. And I would argue we're probably the most vulnerable of uh, all of those countries involved in Echelon. And so now we will attract the interest of U.S. adversaries because we're on the front line with the Americans. And I don't find that, I really don't think it's going to be tenable over the long term to try to trade preferentially with the Chinese and try to be first tier security partners with the United States given the emergent strategic competition between China and the United States and given the fact that both China and the United States consider economic espionage to be a national security issue. Okay, but saying all of this, the GCSB has clearly looked at the security threat that's posed to New Zealand and seems to think that we have the technology in place to protect ourselves. We can tell if someone is spying on us. And you've suggested that might be the case because we're a small network here. Yes, I think that we do have advantages because of the small size. If you had asked me a month ago, if I would take the GCSB's word at face value, I would have said absolutely. You know, they're, they're clearly experts in this field. But given revelations over the past month of some playing loose with the rules on the part of the GCSB when it comes to uh, electronic espionage, I think, you know, it may not be so much their expertise that is lacking, but there may be some political common sense that is lacking in seeing obvious threats, but discounting them because of the interest in trade, the interest right. in, in trying to straddle the fence between these two great powers. And again, I do not think that is tenable over the long term. At the moment, our security strategy is essentially overseen by uh, uh, the Prime Minister and Paul Nays, the Inspector General of Intelligence. Is that the right strategy, those two? Uh, no, I, I, to be honest with you, I think that we need a reform of the oversight and accountability mechanisms governing New Zealand intelligence. Uh, the, the latest uh, discussions about the GCSB and when I follow on the heels of a series of untoward events involving the SIS, now the GCSB, and we have one individual as the oversight on both of these agencies, any of very important agencies, that individual is the prime minister. If the prime minister is very hands-on, that raises the possibility of political manipulation of intelligence. If the prime minister is very hands-off, that allows these agencies to play loose with the rules as we may have just seen. So I think that we need to think about the oversight. The inspector general has to be a retired high court justice. That means that it's an elderly person, very under-resourced. They have the equivalent of a 0.5 personnel. And they depend on the SIS for all their resources. Their charter is extremely circumscribed. So to be honest with you, it, to me it appears that the IG is more of a facade than a truly independent investigator of the activities of the agencies that he's charged to, to oversee. So I think that this is the time, given that we've had now a public discussion 
about these agencies for Parliament to rethink its role in this, because the Parliament Committee on Security Intelligence is, I'd hate to say it, but a toothless wonder. You know, they, they don't even meet once a month. They're not allowed to learn anything about operational details. Uh, triangulation is the name of the game. You not only need triangulation and intelligence sources, but you need at least three independent ver verifiers of right. what intelligence agencies are doing, and we don't have that here. All right, we have to leave it there. Paul Buchanan, very much appreciate your time this morning. Thank you.